I'm very pleased to be here, to, well, <laughs> that you are here. I'm very pleased to be in this position where I can introduce my guests here to you. The only bad news is that we're missing two members of our group, um, Townsend Middleton, who, uh, switched, who couldn't come, but we knew about it early on. Uh, but Susan Lepsilter, who many of you I know uh, were anticipating and expecting, waiting to hear from, but she, um, she got sick just days before the departure. But we have rescheduled her flight, and she will hopefully be coming in, uh, in the spring, and we will probably have another event uh, specially for her. Uh, I want to begin by shortly introducing our guests. Uh, you, most of you know about them from my classes, from the promotional material, uh, from the readings that I assign, and from all, uh, because I talk about them a lot. <laughs> and you know about this project, uh, uh, anxiety, the Anthropology of Anxiety Project, because I talk about anxiety a lot, and I'm anxious a lot, and a lot of you have shared your anxieties and anxiousness with me a lot too. So this has been a topic of our discussion throughout the classes and private conversations uh, for some time now. So I'm very pleased to have here um, I'll start from Stephanie, Stephanie Lachanche, who I've known from graduate school, uh, who had come here from Paris, um, uh, and Katie Haight Manik. Many of you know her because you've read her stuff. Uh, and she came here from New York, uh, Brooklyn College. Rebecca Lester, you've read some of my students who are here have read her book uh, as well. Uh, she's a chair and a professor of anthropology. Uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, and Saiba Varma, who is a uh, pro professor at San Diego University, California University in San Diego, but who flew in here from New Delhi. Um, I will begin by a short introductory remarks. I hope they're going to be short, and then I'll like smoothly slide into discussing like a very short discussion of my own contribution to this project and I'll try to keep it short because you have me here all the time and uh, uh, if you want to hear more about it you can hear about it anytime. Um, and then I will uh, give more time and space to our guests. So we'll have short flash talks and then I uh, will probably hopefully have a nice discussion uh, afterwards. You're looking at me like I'm doing something no, wrong. No, I'm just looking at you. Okay. <laughs> Should I smile? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when we were preparing the promotional material for this uh, event, Becca uh, Kokaya, who is our PR manager, many of you know, uh, he called me and he asked me um, what was the right Georgian title for the project. Uh, is it, he said, is it Spotis or Spotvis? And it got me thinking, and then uh, Tado and I looked it up, and in, indeed there are two words in Georgian for anxiety, Spoti and Spotva, one without V and another with V. Um, and uh, pr psychologists predominantly use Spotva, one with V, um, but shpoti, besides being defined as restlessness, worry, agitation, in its singular form without V, implies a state of collective affairs, a form of public life uh, that includes rupture, restlessness, and political conflict. And I want to pause on this for a bit, uh, because these distinction between the two versions of Georgian word anxiety is no longer attended to in that sense, but in the old Georgian texts, including Life of Cartley, to the 19th century uh, publications, Shpoti without V um, is quite often not about worry, uh, but is about rupture in social life, in political life. Um, so the country was taken over by anxiety would be that uh, Georgia has been attacked by external enemy, but it is also steered from the, in, from the inside, just like any day, um, and fractured into hostile camps. 
Shpotambochi is a more concrete version of this, which means uh, anxiety, which is like a comp you know, composure of two words, anxiety and rebellion. And there's even a word for a person who incites uh, these in, this internal public anxiety, shpotistavi, and you can, you can find these in the vocabulary. And, um, and I latch on this distinction and stick with shpoti, uh, without V precisely because of my and our focus on anxiety, social and political dimension. The, the, to be sure, very anthropological and our take on anxiety as developed throughout this project um, is premised first and foremost on the understanding of a notion of anxiety that is inherently social and culturally configured or pre-configured phenomena. Uh, and we move beyond the distinction between individual anxiety and collective anxiety or uh, like uh, public and private anxiety uh, because um, we take as a premise kind of that no mental or bodily state can be uh, extracted from social and cultural or political forces. And I think you'll hear Rebecca's talk uh, or Rebecca's work in general about disorders, mental disorders or eating disorders demonstrates this most vividly in her book, Famished. Um, inversely, no social or cultural phenomena can be thought uh, through as solely um, mental or discursive or symbolic, etc. All states are embodied, all cognitive states are embodied and all, all social states are embodied. Um, and uh, Katie's work highlights that in a very dramatic way. Um, Shpati without V in the all Georgian speech genre is about the kind of disturbance which blurs the boundary between external enemy and internal enemies, between forms of otherness that seem equally threatening, like the traitor from the inside or the external enemy, and equally ambiguous. And anxiety then becomes the state of these ambiguous boundaries. And Stephanie's work speaks directly to this relationship of anxiety and borderlands and various kinds of borderlands, institutional and national and individual and professional and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, and then Saiba's work highlights the, how the, this intricate connection between uh, institutional, broader public forms of anxiety and it's the ways that it can be projected on it through individual anxieties. Uh, so our conceptualization of anxiety definitely um, highlights the social and its encultured nature, and I'll be saying this word a couple of times, uh, uh, even as we speak of, um, of its embodied psycho uh, phys physiologically or discursively expressed condition. Uh, and um, so, Shpati without V is embodied too, even though it highlights this political condition, it is embodied um, in the political body of a nation in this case, um, in the individual bodies of citizen subjects. And we feel this every day, uh, recently with more nauseating intensity than ever. Um, but it is also diffused in discourse, in epistemic traditions, like Saiba's work will show here, institutional structures uh, like clinics, and um, Sa Stephanie will talk about that, or, or political behaviors such as protests, and we know this from our own experience, or including so social relations like romantic relations that Rebecca will talk about here, but also ordinary practices like workout and Katie's work highlights that. Or like very vague sensations like Jamme Vu that uh, Susan Lepsolter would have talked about uh, if she were here. Um, and none of this may ever reference or explicitly be about worrying or nervousness. And this is kind of our starting point, or at least my work's starting point, that anxiety as proposed here is not about worry uh, or an objectless fear, but it is a register of being 
uh, that itself incorporates various repertoires of affects, emotions, thoughts, and actions. And as a mode of sensing that we say it is, anxiety is not just about affects that come in bodily intensities, um, and not, nor about objectless emotions. Um, rather, anxiety is what Heidegger would call a form of disposedness uh, that encapsulates awareness, awareness that is rooted in our social experience and included in cultural frames of thought. And a cultural, an experience that includes not only our autobiographical individual experience, but our experience as a collective body that is informed by narratives and cognitive frames and what George Lakoff calls scripts. Um, and in that sense, by talking about that, our conceptualization of anxiety bridges affect and semiosis in a particular way. And you will see how this plays out in different ways throughout our papers. Um, so in this attempt to explore this intricate space between uh, that sits between body and consciousness on the one hand, and uh, on the other, the public or the political, institutional or uh, regimes of discourse, institutional life or regimes of discourse, I begin with an ethnographic case that demonstrates how anxiety is something discharged from public realm into the nervous system of an individual. How anxiety can become this kind of leaky content of consciousness that floods everything, including intimate relations with one's husband. Um, <clears throat> and it demonstrates how the reality through encultured nervous systems uh, is sensed uh, through that encultured nervous systems to make calculation about, calculations about what's coming next. Uh, calculations for which we take up the cultural schemas as kind of subliminal algorithms to calculate um, to or to uh, calculate the modes of anticipation that inform our modes of anticipation. Um, so the particular anxiety in this case that I'm talking about is the one that kind of dwells or in hiding um, and that I as a subject of anxiety, may not recognize as mine, uh, but it nevertheless invades my consciousness and it can become me when my mind is left unattended to wander in the phantasmagorias of the dreamscapes. Um, and the, but nevertheless, this is the anxiety that is shaped by the cultural and political and historical legacies of the geographic space uh, or the topo political topographies that I'm uh, located within. Just to be, um, let me show you what I mean. So I begin, uh, I will read out now uh, from my uh, quote from my respondent, but you can read it, parts of it in Georgian. I will read it in English. I'm seeing very strange dreams lately. Uh, you remind me of time. Okay. Um, Ina, a woman in her 30s, tells me while she polishes my nails. Ina is a seventh generation ethnic Armenian living in Tbilisi. Her husband is Georgian and they have two kids, both of them who uh, speak uh, multiple languages, including Russian, Georgian and Armenian. Uh, and she has a BA degree in natural sciences, but has longed as a nail professional, has worked as a nail professional for a very long time. And she lives in a borrowed apartment, borrowed from her uncle, with that kind of precarious worry all the time that her uncle will ask for that apartment back at some point. Uh, and I ask her, what kind of dreams, Ina, political or phantasmagoric? I don't know why I asked that, but I kind of sensed she was telling me not about her personal dream. If I tell you, Nutsa, you might go crazy. In my dream, me and my husband, we didn't have water and went to a bath. You know what, it, it was, in my dream, for some reason, I thought that it was old times, well, 90s. So we went to the bath, and, um, and then um, everyone at the bath, from a sewer to janitors, to the owner, are Azerbaijanis. Um, there are lines there, we booked the room, and we turn, uh, when our turn came, 
and then she paused here in kind of suspense. My husband is nowhere to be found. I came out and tell my husband, are you coming or not? And my husband is sitting, I swear to my two kids, Nutsa, he's sitting alone and everyone around him, the bath owners, the janitors, they're all Azerbaijanis, are standing and are drilling Gruzovan, him, my husband. What do you need this Armenian wife for? Don't you know what they have done to us? We should kill her now. And my husband there is crying with tears running down like this, and Azerbaijanis are holding these documents and showing him, um, I think I'm on, yeah, and showing him um, here, in that year they, Armenians, did this to us, and in that year they did that to us, um, and you don't need this Armenian wife, what do you need her for? And I, and my husband is believing them. That's the point. That's, that's what most hurt me in my dream. So I'm telling him, have you gone mad? Why are you listening to this, uh, to, to these people? I don't even know them, she tells him. And then her husband responds, you people really turn out to be rotten, dumplebi. What have you done to this poor nation? And you're useless. And I wake up, and thankfully then she says, I woke up because they were gonna kill me. And, and you could tell like, while she's telling the dream, she's still horrified. And not only because she's horrified what a, her husband has done in her dream, but she's horrified that she dreamed this dream. And then for a very long time in our conversation, uh, she talks about trying to figure out why she dream this dream. And it, it's not that she's trying to figure out. She has really no answers. She has no answers because she, it's, it's the, uh, the period when the Karabakh war once again broke out. And it's right there in a very, uh, in her time space. But she says, I've never thought about this. This is, does not concern me. I don't take sides in this war. We never talk about this. And why did I dream this? And I dream about my father, for instance, whom I hadn't seen in 12 years. Um, and after that, so very, a lot of venting went on from her side, but she could tell she was horrified by the fact that her mind can conjure up a plot line that says something about um, the way she kind of what she dreads internally. And she says that at some point. Uh, Your yeah. slides are not showing. They're behind here. Oh, we have them over here. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have two of them uh, going. Got it. And, uh, yeah, she, she mentions that, like, in my internal, shinagani dardi, my internal, sad, uh, like, worry. Uh, apparently, it's, it's been bothering me from the inside, but sh that the fact that she has not never thought about it um, uh, is emphasized all along. And then she she finally made this very interesting comment about how she has a, a friends from of different ethnic backgrounds, um, and and that how mo many of them are Christian now, like I have Azerbaijani friends and these different kind of friends, but she says, you cannot do anything with nationality. Even if I live here for 5,000 generations, I'd still be Armenian, she says that. And it was um, interesting and very uh, and signaling something for me there. Um, now there's a big, big body of literature on dreaming uh, in anthropology, and I'm not gonna go into it, but Many of them point out how culture colors and structures emotional problems. Um, and we see that come out, like how dreams attend to that. Um, and the a lot, vast literature on dreaming and anthropology also kind of looks at this convergence between anxiety and dreaming um, and showing how anxiety is induced by changing socio-political and economic circumstances are reflected in individuals' dreams. But Ina's dream is not about her emotional problems with her husband. She doesn't have one. Uh, it's about something else, I think. Uh, but as Mageo points out, nightly dreams dramatize our most profound and troubled encounters with the socio-cultural uh, socio and political worlds that coerce and exploit us. Dreams are descents into unguarded experience, into preoccupations, questions, fears, wishes, and mental wanderings. 
Hence, they give special access to lived subjectivity, in particular historical moments. In this paper, I dream, I dream, I look at dreams that dramatize people's political anxieties. Um, and in doing so, I also dwell on how and when do dreams themselves become the object of social reflection and concern. So I speak about, I won't go into the detail into that a lot. This paper revolves mainly about Ina's dream, but there are other people's dreams, some of whom you, the audience knows here, uh, and some of those dream contents you may have read on Facebook. But, uh, and then I conceptually some of the dreams, but um, instead I wanna go into this particular dream and what it tells me about anxiety as a social and cultural phenomena as such. Uh, now Ina's dream says something about how nationalism and national politics invade, original politics invade our bodies and our unconscious states. And un dreaming is a kind of, in a way, a borderland, as Stephanie once suggested, borderland between consciousness and unconsciousness, but also borderland between pub private, intimate, and public spaces. Um, and her dream is a leak, a kind of a sedimented anxiety about something that she takes no time to worry about. And it is oriented toward the future, toward what is coming. Next, it kind of anticipates this radicalization of ethnic identities, the possibility that even her husband's, the most intimate person's identity, can snap out of place, as Kathleen Stewart would say, it, um, and can turn against her. But instead of being her anxiety being about her dr anxiety, dream anxiety being. Um, just an affect or a just a visceral intensity or unclassified bodily state as affects are oftentimes defined. Rather, it is a scripted text, scripted along the narratives and memory regimes that have been shaping regional politics in the South, South Caucasus, at least since the Soviet era. And some, some of the symbols give away uh, in her dream, give that away, right? Uh, there's a uh, disturbance, like in the form of water shortage, which tells her what time line it is, that it's 90s. And 90s is a time period of shortages and warfares. So her dream is, in a sense, about wars and shortages, or shortages are a trigger that kind of tell her uh, what is going on in the world. Um, and then that time period, as in 90s, was all, is also about not just wars between the states, but it's about radicalization of ethnic identities, about the uh, setting in which everyone's identity becomes ethnicized and you cannot get rid of that part of yourself. And so her dream uh, then it also displays this symbolism of memory wars that informed and really shaped and structured the conflict zones and the disturbed region of the South Caucasus. And it, it was fascinating to me, probably if I had asked Ina at any point, like, have you heard how epistemic traditions of Soviet historiography and memory wars had shaped Karabakh and any other ethnic conflict in the region? She would probably go, no, I don't. Probably she hasn't thought about how history textbooks did something to, to us or the historians who constructed these narratives about ethnogenesis and all that stuff. But nevertheless, in her dream, there's this scene where Azerbaijanis are waving the historical documents in her husband's face to prove that she, he doesn't need an Armenian wife, to prove all the historical wrongdoings that Armenians have done against Azerbaijanis. And it's, um, it's, it's amazing. It tells us so much about what Kathleen Stewart calls, the closest thing, atmospheric attunements, how things we don't think about really inform the ways in which we experience uh, life. Um, so, and I'm going to finish off now. I'll probably over 15 minutes. Yeah. So Ina's, Ina's anxiety is not about the fear of death from an encroaching warfare. It's very distant to her in a way. But it's rather about 
ontological insecurity about her own identity, about her own identity not to herself as an essential self, but what her identity is to another, to a very close another. And this is a very kind of based in a very Lacanian understanding of, of anxiety. Um, and it is about the, this tense form of anticipation that sits in her without her really knowing that is, that's what she's fearing, in a, that's what she's anticipating in dread, that the time will come when these identities will snap out of place and radicalize. Um, and it, finally, it's about, among other things, embodied vulnerability, right? Which is, in, in and of itself, expressed in the fact that she's dreaming this plot line, this, this horrendous, dystopian plot that can play out between her and her husband. And it, it kind of embodies itself, um, the regional vulnerabilities. Um, so a lot of, time, a lot of li literature on anxiety says something how anxiety is different from fear in, in a sense that it's, uh, it has no object. Um, and we kind of go against that <laughs> in this group. Uh, it, it, we, we say that anxiety arises not because it lacks or is uncertain about its source or its object, but anxiety ari arises out of excess of triggers, out of just too many possibilities of radically different scenarios. It arises, it dwells in places where, where it's not that we don't know what's coming. We just think there's so many different possibilities in which the catastrophe could play out. And we call that when the field of the future is semantically overdetermined rather than underdetermined, which would be uh, the way we talk about uncertainty, right? Um, but in this particular case, uh, we can talk about anxiety, Ina's anxiety in particular, uh, as something that that in a Lacanian sense spurs out of, uh, out of the ambiguity about others' desire for me and my inability to determine my identity in the face of that another. And in this case, it's he, she and her husband standing one in, a, in front of one another in that mask um, and in his inability to define if she's going to turn into an alterity, alterity for her own husband. So uh, to sum up, uh, we talk about anxiety throughout this project uh, in different ways. So we talk about anxiety kind of as a specter, as a, as, as a variety of registers. But in many cases, anxiety can be subdued. It can be subterranean, uh, low-intensity tension, which produces kind of tense anticipations. But it is essentially about the relation to the self. So anxiety can become very specific and about, like, anxiety can be expressed in a worry about a very specific thing, like workout, or like referrals, or like particular dream. But it is actually informed by bigger attunements, bigger atmospheric, bigger awareness about the shifting, precarious world that fundamentally shapes how we think about ourselves. So at the core of in, uh, anxiety is this insecurity about one's own self, about the question of who am I essentially and who am I in the face of another. Um, yeah, I'll... Thank you. I'll finish off here. I don't have a thank you slide. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name is Katie Rose Haitmonic, and I'm going to be talking to you about CrossFit. And my title is CrossFit and the Conjuring and Calming of Anxiety. How many of you are familiar with the workout regimen of CrossFit? A few of you. Okay, so it's this high intensity, it's sort of, um, some pictures of it is sort of started with the militarism in the United States, Navy SEALs. Um, and then the second picture, the below picture, are uh, famous CrossFit athletes who um, do this for professional um, worlds. Um, so, but these are the kinds of bodies that are built in the uh, original world of CrossFit. Uh, 
Oh, maybe. I do have a lot of pictures, so. Okay. There we go. Is that better? Okay. 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 So, um, okay. It begins the night before. I'm going to be giving you some uh, ethnographic bits right here. So I'm going to read a story um, from a book, from this book, Learning to Breathe Fire. So, and my own personal experience doing, doing a workout called Fran. So it begins the night before. I check the website for tomorrow's workout of the day at WAD. What will it be? How much will it hurt? The, work it is, the workout is a tough one called Fran. Will I puke from exertion? Will I get Fran lung? Will I rip my palms from the movements that require a strong grip? I shouldn't have checked the website. I'll have trouble sleeping. In her book on the rise of CrossFit, journalist and CrossFitter J.C. Hertz tells the story of Fran. If you bring the, a weighted bar, bar to your chest, then go as low as you can in a full squat and then explode up to drive the bar all the way over your head. That's what's now called a thruster. If you do 10 of these in a row, it takes you toward that feeling, gasping for air, wanting to vomit. As the story goes, Greg Glassman, the creator and former owner and CEO of CrossFit, did 21 thrusters in a row, then jumped up on the pull-up bar in the door jam and did 21 pull-ups. Then he had 15 thrusters, 15 pull-ups, nine thrusters, nine pull-ups. Then he unceremoniously threw up on the floor. Victory. As his German shepherd dogs licked up the mess, Glassman raced across the street, vomit still on his shirt, to his friend Brian's house and banged on the door. Brian, a fellow gymnast, stared in alarm at his panting friend. Dude, what's all over your shirt? Never mind, come with me. They went to Greg's garage and repeated the workout. Brian threw up. It was awesome. They ran across the street to get Brian's brother and bolted into his room. What's on you guys? You smell like vomit. Come on, they yelled the way the teenagers always do when they've discovered the be all, end all, coolest thing ever. I don't think so, his brother says. Thus was born the most dreaded workout in CrossFit, later known as Fran. 21 thrusters, followed by 21 pull ups, then 15 of each, then nine of each. 21, 15, nine, as in red in CrossFit. Um, and it's, this is from a website to a regular CrossFit gym. It's the classic, the degree of difficulty should be at your edge of your ability. Fran is designed to hurt. Its very inception is based on the desire to have that feeling of being overwhelmed by physical pursuits. The gymnasts, the gymnastic judges, those who focus on perfection and perfect execution and beauty and grace do not want to see. Glassman says, quote, if you get off the apparatus, the uneven bars or the parallel bars, and you're hunched over or you vomit or you're gate-mouthed, breathing hard, wild in terror, you'll be deducted for that. Hunched over, ready to vomit, breathing hard, wild in terror, Fran was designed to make you feel this way, mentally and physically. Throughout the night and at the gym the next morning, I'm anxious. My heart is pre-workout racing. My hands are pre-workout sweaty. How can I approach Fran, which qu requires a strong grip on a pull-up bar and a barbell with sweaty palms? How can my heart withstand Fran if it's already beating out of my chest? Where's the chalk for my palms? A deep breath should help my heart. It doesn't. Three, two, one, go, yells the coach as the clock beeps for each second and then a louder on the go. My heart's heart rate spark spikes and my stomach drops. Two minutes into the workout, I think, this hurts so bad. My muscles are burning, filled with lactic acid. Lactic acid buildup is a biological process. As the body moves muscles, metabolize energy, and, ener and this produces lactate. Lactate can generate more energy unless the body is producing more of it than it can expel. As lactate accumulates, the blood becomes acidic, which the brain identifies as a toxic environment. To detoxify and find equilibrium, the body expels excess lactate. Sometimes you vomit. Fran is famous for making people vomit. I stand akimbo, the classic out of breath pose, and strategize how to finish without vomiting. I want to stop. Will I keep going? The logic of CrossFit is that workouts are variable, which means they're different every time. They're, funk they're hard or intense. 
and they're functional. They use movements that reflect everyday tasks, like squats for getting up and down out of chairs, or deadlifts, which help you get a pencil off the floor. And if you regularly attend an hour-long group fitness class, you can complete a hero workout or a girl workout like Fran. Unlike sports, where athletes practice their specific events, CrossFit emerged as a fitness regimen to train Navy SEALs and first responders, firefighters, emergency personnel, police officers. Those who perform heroic tasks, not, they're not playing games. CrossFit prides itself on preparing participants for extreme body and mind challenges by programming varied, intense, functional workouts often published on the gym's website the night before. Can you adapt to the extreme workout thrown your way? Are you prepared for the unknown? Crossfitters sign up for this and pay a lot of money, hundreds of dollars a month, they, they, to push themselves to extreme points of exertion to maybe puke, alongside others before or after a day at a law, financial, or academic office. We aren't tra actually training for war. We're just going to the gym. At four minutes in, I stumble to the pull-up bar. My anxiety is gone. Now I feel is pain and a deep desire to finish. So it all stops. I pull my body up four times. I have five more pull-ups. I drop down. I look at the clock hoping to finish the workout in 20 more seconds. I jump back up and do two more pull-ups. I drop down, hands on my hips. I take a deep breath and I jump back up. I do two more. I hold onto the bar, negotiating with myself. If you do it one more time, you don't have to jump up and down again. I pull myself as hard as I can, but I can't get my chin over the bar for a full rep. I drop. Katie, finish, coach screams. I jump up as, and pull as hard as I can. I'm feverishly kicking my legs so that I can get my chin over the bar. I do. I let go and I collapse on the ground. The workout took me less than five minutes. Everything in me hurts. When, in, when anxiety and desire are gone, I'm availed, available to feel all the pain I have just inflicted upon myself. My head hurts. My face is bright red. My legs and arms swol swollen with lactate pulse with my racing heart. I feel them burning. I haven't vomited or ripped, like the picture here, um, my palms, but for the next two days, I will cough as I breathe. It's called Fran Lung in CrossFit because it's associated with this workout. But it's better known as exercise-induced pulmonary edema, where fluid builds up in the lungs because the lungs can't keep up with the heart, and coughing is the way the body tries to expel that built-up fluid in the lungs. We cough for days. We all lay on the ground, like this image, spread eagle, like a sweat angel, cursing the pain as we move, talking about our times. Did we go faster than last time? Did we take fewer akimbo breaks? I'm not coming tomorrow, somebody says. You should move your body around, it'll help you recover, somebody replies. Coach yells to herd the next hour-long group fitness enthusiasts into a circle. We watch them like lambs to the slaughter. They return our gaze, anxiety written on their faces. We serve as a cautionary tale they won't listen to. Coach looks at our gaggle of human debris and says, I'll see you tomorrow. We show up, sore and coughing, what's the punishment today? At the turn of the 21st century, CrossFit emerged as a rogue fitness exercise method that demanded participants tap into a primal need to be extremely physical, finding, quote, redemption in our, their willingness to be so. This is the, the Hertz book again. CrossFit has fashioned itself as an activity that wakes, makes one feel alive through enduring physical, and pain, physical pain. This intensity is what it means to be human and is missing from our modern, boring lives. Hertz writes, I do not live in the Paleolithic. I have all the gadgets and creature comforts of a plush, sedentary, chronically ill society and I can't help to believe that the path out of physiological purgatory is through CrossFit. Hertz uses Christian purgatory and redemption uh, frames and evolutionary frames like modernity and the Paleolithic to articulate CrossFitters' desire for a primal experience of physical pain. CrossFit and these frames have since morphed into a popular fitness method for mostly white, elite, rich Americans, where the pursuit of physical pain and voluntary existential anxiety are felt and then disciplined. 
Amy, this is an image of her after a, it was a social media image after a different workout and then an uh, interview um, transcript from her. All of a sudden you realize how insane the workouts seem and it becomes this mental game. You set expectations for yourself in the beginning based on your fitness level. Then you get into it, then there's a whole bunch of feelings and thoughts screaming inside your head. Oh my God, this is so hard. I can't breathe. Oh, this is really heavy. I don't know how much longer I can do this. Okay, no, keep going. And like that whole journey of getting through any given workout becomes its own form of fitness, of mental fitness. CrossFit retrains you to think through any given situation and try to come up with a plan or strategies. If this seems impossible, what am I going to do to make it possible? It's not a cure-all because anxiety is still a very much a part of my day-to-day, but at the end of the day, CrossFit has made me better able to deal with highly stressful situations because of the way you have to almost mentally trick yourself to get through some of the workouts that you do. And then you get to the other side, you're marveling at your own capabilities. CrossFit develops mental fitness, a puzzling through the emergence of terrible feelings and screaming thoughts to come up with a plan to mentally trick yourself to move through anxiety and pain to from anxiety and pain to, okay, no, keep going. I've argued elsewhere that CrossFit is a practice that allows elite white Americans to deal with apocalyptic fears that their world of power and privilege is ending. Here I want to provide a brief analysis of the journeying through pain and anxiety in a workout, what I call the practice of conjuring and calming anxiety that prepares one in, for other life situations. So CrossFit is designed to be axiogenic. The existential anxiety conjured during CrossFit workouts can be understood as the as Heidegger's anxiety of ontological being, resulting from what, from what Nutza calls the instability of the self. By Ishvili, Nutza writes that anxiety is primarily rooted in anticip intense anticipation, conscious or not, of the future, and an oscillating sense of self trying to determine the potentiality of being. The temporality of, of anxiety is an alternating from past to future. Nutza writes, present situation, sensations, the feelings of pain, the lactate, the cough, the, all of that, are, the present sensations are invaded by the sensibilities accumulated from past experiences and give rise to preemptive sensing of the future. In CrossFit, the pain of previous workouts gives rise to an anxious anticipation of the danger and pain of future workouts. The anxiety demands an existential reckoning. What am I capable of? What is my potential? CrossFit was designed to be about life and death, about US soldiering during the war on terror, about real anxiety of the future and potentiality of being, life and death. CrossFit was a form of edge work, what sociologist Stephen Ling defines as a skillful negotiation of boundaries between life and death, chaos, on, chaos and disorder during high-risk activities. Think skydiving, motorcycle racing, firefighting. But as it moved from into the mainstream from this military realm and became an exercise regimen for the professional middle class, it retreated from the edge. And CrossFit anxiety about danger and pain became a simulation or a fantasy. One doesn't have to go to the gym or push oneself to puke or to develop Fran lung, but people do for fun as a leisure activity. CrossFit ideology is also designed to calm the anxiety it conjures. To use the work of Paul Tillich, one must transform the anxiety of potentiality into fear, into something to be afraid of, to find the courage to face this fear. And anxiety, the anxiety of potentiality, what's the workout, will I be able to make it through, becomes the fear of Fran. And one must find the courage to make it through 21, 15, 9. CrossFit, CrossFit fosters courage and calms anxiety in two ways. First, CrossFit gyms cultivate courageous subjectivities by teaching members to push through pain and anxiety by thinking, I can do this. I have been training my body to suffer this pain. Today is just another day, right? The amount of mental trickery and internal screaming was next level. But, okay, now don't you dare stop, right? Secondly, you, you, you have been training yourself to think that you can make it through. Secondly, CrossFit encourages a scaling of a workout. 
So scaling is a CrossFit term meaning to change the workout to make it achievable for you. This is an image from CrossFit uh, website where the first one, the one furthest towards Fran, is an actual pull-up. If you can't do a pull-up, then you can put a box and you can kind of help yourself up onto the pull-up bar from the box. Or you can jump up from the box, or you can use these rings and just pull yourself, it's called a ring row. So if you can't do a pull-up, you can actually make it doable by doing a ring row. Um, and the, in the, in the uh, website, it says scale accordingly. Find what you can do and maybe sub jumping pull-ups or do fewer reps. Instead of 21, maybe do 15 to start and then nine and then maybe six. Okay? So the calming of anxiety in CrossFit then is to A, find the courage to face the pain of the workout and then two, to find a way to scale the workout so that it's hard but doable. A manipulation of the workout to make it manageable for me. Why do CrossFitters put themselves through this anxiety, fear, and pain when they don't have to? Why do they conjure and calm anxiety in the gym? Professional middle-class CrossFitters like Amy use the simulation of, anger, of anxiety, danger, and pain in the gym to practice for seemingly sharp edges of everyday life. This is an image from uh, social media where she, this uh, Amy is using her workout to relate to and manage her anxiety and anger towards an e a work email. Okay, so Amy uses the simulation of, a of anxiety, danger, and pain in the gym to practice for the seemingly sharp edges of everyday life. Crossfitters are probing anxiety in a voluntary, simulated high stakes environment in order to practice managing anxiety elsewhere. As Amy stated, doing CrossFit prepares her to handle highly stressful, varied intense, axiogenic life situations outside of the gym. CrossFit requests the capable embodied self show up at the gym as rehearsal to brave a work meeting. By putting the body on the line, its pain, its suffering, its biological breakdown during a workout, the mind must find a way to see the body safely through the workout by finding the sustainable edge of this suffering with a capable embodied self inside and outside the gym. The conjuring and calming of anxiety in a CrossFit gym prompts me to ask you all two questions that I hope you'll help me answer. What does it say about privileged white Americans and contemporary American society that so many elite feel they need to train for war to get through the anxiety of simply living? And what does it mean that their courage and antidote for anxiety involves scaling or manipulating the world around them? Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much to Nutza for hosting us and to Katie and Stephanie for also being part of the planning team. This has just been great. It's really, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about a new research project that I've been doing recently. Um, so it's still in process. I'm eager to hear feedback and have some discussion about it as well. There's nothing like that feeling when my wife comes home from a date and she's soaring and giddy because it went so well. And I'm like, that's amazing, babe. I'm so happy for you. And I truly am. It brings me so much joy. I love seeing her in love. This is how Tim, a 46-year-old IT manager, described his experience of polyamory. The practice of engaging in romantic and typically sexual relationships with more than one person with the full knowledge and consent of everyone involved. Tim is one of millions of Americans who have recently opened up their marriages and other romantic partnerships to explore intimate connections with others. Polyamory is, by many reports, the fastest growing sexual practice in the United States, with estimates that one in five American adults is engaged in a polyamorous relationship. While open relationships themselves are certainly not new, polyamory is quickly moving from the fringe to the center. Both NPR and Scientific American have characterized the rise in polyamory as the new sexual revolution. From feature articles in Medium, Vogue, and The Atlantic, to reality TV shows and plot lines and network dramas, polyamory is way, well on its way to becoming American mainstream. In a society built on the bedrock of heterosexual monogamous marriage and the centrality of the nuclear family, something tectonic is shifting in how many Americans think about, practice, and experience sexual and emotional intimacy. 
But polyamory or poly is not just about sexual or, rom or romantic freedom, nor does it exist in a historical vacuum. Whoops. Unlike polygamy or plural marriage, poly is a secular practice that has its roots in countercultural and revolutionary initiatives. Non-monogamy has been central to the ideologies of many social movements, from early Marxist projects to the commune movements in the US of the 1960s and 70s, all of which center on critiques of the family, monogamy, and private property. Contemporary polyamory has arisen from a confluence of these, uh, a number of these liberationalist discourses and challenges some of the most fundamental assumptions of Western capitalist culture, predicated on compulsory monogamy and structures of the family that are meant to preserve the value of private property ownership. I do this because I want to change the world, Annika, a 52-year-old white woman, told me. We live in such a dominance-oriented society. Everyone's out for themselves, and there's this scarcity mindset. Like, if you get something, that means there's less for me. So I'd better beat you to it and then keep it for myself. Polyamory is different. We operate from a mindset of abundance, egalitarianism, and community. We envision a different kind of society. I look at it like this. You can change laws and you can change policies, but to really move the needle, you need to change families. When you change families, that's what will bring about real cultural change. So in the context of political polarization, challenges to reproductive rights, protracted economic instability, and alarming global conflict, practitioners of polyamory like Annika often explicitly understand their intimate practices as ethical and political projects aimed at countering dominant structures of capitalism and individualism. The interesting question then becomes, why is polyamory thriving in the United States now? In exploring polyamory's appeal and the nuances of its practice, we can not only better understand this trend, but we can also trace some of the ways that intimate personal affects can become bound up with issues of national and even international import, and how relationship structures can both undergird and destabilize existing narratives of love, family, sociality, and commitment. So scholars in a range of disciplines, cultural studies, sociology, queer studies, psychology, and others have, have traced these contours of polyamory in the United States and have speculated about what might account for this flourishing. Yet despite this um, explosion of what some practitioners call it designer relationships, there's been very little anthropological attention to this phenomenon, which is pretty surprising given that anthropologists are very interested in kinship and the family and, and these sorts of things. So what's been missing in this literature is an approach that can illuminate how the private intimate practices of polyamory, polyamory articulate with broader social and cultural elements and why it matters. So engaging with these questions, I have so far talked to about 75 people from all walks of life who identify as polyamorous. Bankers, DJs, nurses, corporate executives, genetic scientists, military personnel, academics, truck drivers, housewives, businesswomen. I've spoken to couples just beginning to consider opening up their relationships, couples who are newly poly or have been married in poly for many years, and others who tried poly and decided it was not for them. I've talked to people who practice solo poly, kitchen table poly, non-hierarchical poly, and relationship anarchy. I've attended national polyamory conferences and learned about people's pathways into the polyamorous lifestyle, the racial dynamics in the poly community, which we can talk about, how to foster secure attachments and polyamorous relationships, um, and how to deal with jealousy and one's partner and oneself. And I've also spent a lot of time engaging with polyamory blogs, Facebook groups, Instagram and Reddit posts, um, and just various discussion boards where people seek connection, information, and support. So this is everywhere in American society right now. In the course of this research, it quickly became apparent to me that, that while polyamory is explicitly about relationship structure, it is at heart an affective practice in, in Margaret Wetherell's sense, in that it brings about certain kinds of affective states through the act of participating in it, and it naturalizes these states over time. And then also by binding practitioners into collectivities and constituting and reconstituting them in relation to structures of, and flows of power, polyamory also serves as an affective economy on a different level of analysis in Sarah Ahmed's terms. So with these concepts in mind, we can start to see 
how the practice of polyamory entails this, a continual crafting and tinkering with the ethical self that's taken on a particular kind of meaning in, in 20th century American culture. So to get at these, these issues or begin to kind of touch on them here, um, I focus on one through line of polyamory practice, the role and function of anxiety as what Susan Lepselter refers to as a vernacular theory of power. So self-fashioning through anxiety and polyamory shows us how these practices weave together um, affective configurations across different domains, bringing the, the intimate practices of attachment and desire into conversation with changing economic, social, and political landscapes in 21st century America. And of course, anxiety holds a very special place in the American experiment. From a Protestant ethic fueled by anxiety about sal salvation, to Auden's pronouncement about the age of anxiety, to color-coded threat levels and stand your ground legislation, the United States is palpably vibrating with anxiety. This anxious energy resonates with the experiences of individual Americans as well. Rates of anxiety have skyrocketed over, skyrocketed over the past decade with a massive 25% increase in the wake of the COVID pandemic. And anxiety has come to permeate all levels of American society, rendering us a nation teetering on the brink of panic, which speaks to some <laughs> of what Katie was just talking about, about we better be prepared for whatever's coming. Anxiety in the 21st century, in 21st century America is what uh, Tvekovic calls a public feeling, an ethos or a vibe that dominates and organizes social life. Its logics justify political, social, and interpersonal actions that in turn legitimate a worldview in which living in a, height of heightened, a state of heightened sensitivity and readiness to react is moralized as righteous. Whereas America was once characterized as the Prozac nation, today we've become what Williams calls the United States of Xanax. When anxiety takes hold of an individual, a community, a nation, an era, it's difficult to ignore. It demands recognition and carries the imperative to do something to alleviate its grip, even if it's working out until you puke. How we make sense of and respond to anxiety entails judgments not only about the causes of that anxiety, but also how we think about we should feel and behave and relate to others and how the world should function. So in this way, anxiety affords the opportunity for curating a self in relation to both the imagined, uncertain, and perhaps dreaded future and the immediate present. I can do without this Just, lights if um, we need to. Oh, this, it's sleeping, okay. Um, engaging anxiety as both a set of ethical commitments and a laboratory for ethical practice can help us trace anxiety across various domains, subjectivity, sociology, politics, and practice, and opens up some way, new ways for us to think about these intersections. Oh. We can do without it, it's fine. It's just it window dressing, it's fine. <laughs> so returning to, poly, yeah, returning to polyamory, a polyamorous life, lifestyle is one that most people in mainstream America find so anxiety provoking as to be nearly incomprehensible. I could never do that, Evelyn, a 38-year-old lab technician, told me when she learned I was researching polyamory. I wouldn't be able to deal with the jealousy. Your partner going on dates with someone else? Oh, hell no, that it sounds completely exhausting. Annie, a 52-year-old lawyer, had a similar uh, set of concerns. She said, I have enough issues dealing with my one relationship, thank you. James, a 44-year-old business analyst, had a similar view. I don't think I'm secure enough for something like that. I would always be obsessing about, about what my partner was doing with other people, whether she was more fulfilled with them or something. What if she liked one of them better than me? No way. Okay, we can just, that's fine. Is it coming? It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. All right, let's see. Importantly, people who practice polyamory share these concerns. Polyamory is shot through with anxiety, and poly individuals are no more immune to insecurity or cultural messaging about monogamy than anyone else. I never thought I'd be able to do this, Bethany, a 41-year-old teacher, told me about opening her marriage five years ago. Never, and it was brutal in the beginning. He'd be out on a date, and I'd just be at home curled up in the bed sobbing. I was terrified I was making a huge mistake, and he was going to leave. But then he'd come home after a date and tell me about it, and it wasn't so scary. And he was coming home to me. That's part of what's so wonderful, powerful about Polly. 
In some ways, your worst fear comes true. Your partner's romantically interested in somebody else. But you see that that doesn't have to take anything away from what the two of you share, that your connection can survive and even get stronger because of it. In other words, polyamory practitioners have not found some magic solution to get rid of jealousy or insecurity or anxiety. They struggle with it regularly. In polyamory, however, practitioners are encouraged to view this kind of anxiety less as an idiosyncratic individual issue, although it's one that they as individuals are called upon to address, and more as a set of orientations generated in and through dominant structures of ownership, dominance, and individualism that polyamory seeks to destabilize through various forms of ethical relating. Because of this, anxiety and its management are foundational to many of the principles and practices of polyamory and become the cornerstones of this deliberate and pur purposeful refashioning of the self um, in the conditions of late capitalism in 21st century America. In other words, polyamorous people don't do what they do because they don't feel anxiety in the form of jealousy, insecurity, or worry about the future. They do what they do precisely because they do feel it and they are deliberately working to undo the cultural logics and orientations that enable it. This is the core of what makes polyamory, as Olivia Goldhill calls it, the most quietly revolutionary political weapon in the United States, in that it radically reimagines the nature, nature of social connection. Today's polyamorous may not be rejecting conventional jobs or bourgeois consumption, Goldhill notes, but they are shifting fundamental structures of society simply by relating to each other differently. Ideally, this self and emotion work progressively reorients uh, people toward, uh, away from an ethics of scarcity, ownership, and clinging, and toward an ethics of abundance, non-possessiveness, and release. And it's here that polyamory becomes more than an individual sexual or intimate practice. It's a, it's a philosophy of relating that both cultivates and requires a shift in pr practitioners' entire worldviews in ways that have deliberate and explicit political implications. We can't do anything about Russia, their divisiveness in our country, but we can do something about our own relating, said Marley, a 32-year-old bi biracial married woman who's been practicing poly for the past seven years. It's kind of resetting your values, and it's hard, she continued. The hard truth is that capitalism works better with two-person households and nuclear families rather than group or extended family households, because that's how companies sell more stuff. Everyone needs their own houses and microwaves and lawnmowers, and this also creates a class of teens who are desperate for spending money and are willing to flip burgers and work retail. Brent, a 56-year-old white man who became polyamorous following the end of a 27-year monogamous marriage, also identified capitalism and its logics as responsible for the development of compulsory monogamy and an ideal, the idealized relationship structure in the US. And this is what he had to say. After World War II, tens of thousands of men returned from war with no jobs waiting for them because the women had moved into the workforce. So the government had to come up, come up with a way to get the women out of those jobs and back into the home. So they developed policies that pushed the modularization of the nuclear family, like VA loans and things like that. The nuclear American family, husband, wife, and kids living separately in their own home, that's first and foremost a modern political and economic invention meant to benefit corporations and the government. So this is how people are talking about it and what they do. So in contrast, like I said, polyamory is envisioned um, as a way to challenge the centrifugal forces that perpetuate this alienation and separation and the capitalist logics that animate these links between nuclear family structure and private property ownership. Even with their philosophy of abundance, however, many practitioners of polyamory are acutely aware of the practical limitations they face. Love is intimate, but time and resources are not. Arlo, a 41-year-old white male therapist who's married and has been polyamorous for the past 12 years told me. And polyamory, polyamory is not always successful. It's fraught with risks and challenges and deeply felt anxieties, and it can lead to disastrous consequences. And it's an open question whether even successful polyamory accomplishes what its practitioners hope to do. For all the talk about countering hegemonic capitalist cultural structures, poly is, in many ways, a quintessentially neoliberal practice. The highly individualized designer relationships in poly are reflective of broader social and economic trends in the United States, mirror mirroring, for example, shifts to gig work, where people find, uh, configure themselves as 
their own bosses, entrepreneurs patching together different jobs to make an idiosyncratic and self-tailored whole. While practitioners of polyamory seek to change fundamental structures of capitalism by developing these new configurations of intimacy, affinity, and economic ties then, the practice of poly is undeniably grounded in deeply neoliberal understandings of self and agency. By marking the points of intersection between the personal and the political and positioning actors in relation to a variety of ethical commitments, anxiety and polyamory works not only as a vernacular theory of power, but, what it, but as what Simone Ney calls a subject delineating orientation. That is, it defines the subject through which it becomes manifest. The question is whether that subject is truly the anti-capitalist, anti-hegemonic one polyamorous envision or whether it is perhaps instead the fullest expression of 21st century America's most palpable anxieties. Thank you. Françoise Héritier's essays entitled Which Foundations of Violence powerfully engages with human beings' original sense of vulnerability that is consistently tempted to express itself in acts of violence, but which was progressively tamed by establishing borders of meaning, organized around dualities, man, woman, pure, impure, insider, foreigner, etc. Borders do not tolerate ambiguity nor fortuity. They constitute an existential barrier against the anxiety that derives from what cannot be controlled or from the unknown, the uncanny, and what cannot yet be represented. While in reality, borders have relentlessly been renegotiated, they nonetheless keep being resorted to as a primordial truth identity, identity essentialism rests upon. Some contexts and situations are likely to challenge these borders and open up borderlands, that is, stretches of space, both physical or be, be they physical or symbolic, or, or both at the same time, where time, action, or defined categories are suspended. While the suspended, undefined nature of that stretch of space in which one experiences a different and unqualified form of being in the world is by definition anxi anxiety producing, it may also lead to a place of productive contestation, especially in the context of inequality and discrimination. The feeling of time and action being suspended, leaving one in a state of facing the unknown or the undetermined, very much reminds me of Victor, Turn Victor Turner's writing on liminality in the context of rituals. But rituals are guided and have a known ending. In that context, borderland liminality is a place of transformation and creativity. Anxiety related to the unknown is tolerated only because the structure of that liminal phase is defined. But in other circumstances, Borderland liminality may refer to a destructive state of existential limbo, temporally undetermined, and sometimes irremediably challenging the very meaning of being human itself. For example, in the context of global migrations and asylum in particular, anthropologists have documented how this impacts undocumented individuals or asylum seekers. And here in this paper, in this presentation today, I focus on the collateral impact that this sustained state of liminality has on professionals from the social and health service sectors who care from, for liminal beings. So I approach borderland anxiety based on two decades of field work and research on healthcare provision to migrants in Paris and on my own borderland position as an applied anthropologist at this transcultural clinic called uh, Centre Minkowska. The borderlands uh, I refer to, the borderland anxieties I refer to in my work are polysemic. They also include, they refer to uh, the sort of like broader national narrative scripts that uh, Nusa mentioned earlier. But again, today I will focus on the institutional based borderland anxieties. And these anxieties are rooted in the very institutional makeup of Centre Minkowska because unlike uh, other sector-based and state-funded clinics, which, are, we have, which you know, have constraints and administrative or budgetary obligations, 
it's also uh, an association and as an association it also has uh, strong moral ma mandates and a particular ESOF as well as the flexibility to organize clinical activities differently and add other activities like the one I'm in charge of, like for example, professional training, research, and, um, and teaching. And also it offers spaces, as I showed today, spaces of deliberation and advocacy, which are rarely found elsewhere. A central, clinic, a central question though to this um, unique institutional makeup raises uh, is the following does Centre Minkowska act as a stopgap for other mental that for mental health services that migrant populations need because to some extent this the center's unique expertise in caring for those who are excluded from other mainstream institutions may indirectly encourage referring state institutions to remain in exclusionary as those institutions see no need to expand their mandates because they have an alternative on which they can rely, rely on. So this sometimes raises ethical dilemmas and outright feelings of frustrations when staff members encounter referrals where the referring agents cannot or will not engage with migrant patients themselves and inst instead refer to, prefer to abdicate responsibility to someone else, like staff at Centre Mingoska. Another, uh, so beyond the, the, this uh, unique institutional makeup of, of Centro Minkowska as a clinic, there's another important factor, uh, which is that professionals who work at Centro Minkowska do so because of the association's missions of integrating migrants through healthcare matches their personal ethos. For some, in fact, immigration is part of their own personal experience. This means that the logics of work and caregiving at Minkowska are even more deeply rooted in affect and that professionals' moral agency is crucial. Here I address professionals' moral agency as their ability to find an echo between personal and professional ethics of care and responsibility and everyday practice. And in Minkowska work context, moral agency is inextricably linked to improving the unfair system in which professionals themselves are embedded and which inspires feeling of futility when working with vulnerable positions as the referral I will be presenting to you illustrates. Uh, and that referral was, presenting, was presented sorry, during a MediaCorp meeting. MediaCorp refers to a specific uh, pluridisciplinary unit which was set up back in 2009 to help Minkowska professionals make sense of complex referrals. And it was construed as a space of deliberation where the center's cultural competence approach is enacted through the practice of deliberation. So the situation was referred to from a social worker from a CADA. CADA is an acronym that refers to housing centers for asylum seekers. So when you hear me say CADA, think of housing center. So that center was located in a distant city in the south of France. It was presented by Audrey, the center's nurse. Audrey introduced the situation of a 24-year-old man from Afghanistan, whom I named Amza, who only spoke Dari, Dari and who arrived in France in the summer of 2016. We knew few details of his life story. We knew that when he had arrived in Paris, he was taken care of by a French NGO that manages CADA, and right away was transferred to the CADA where he currently resides. His father was a Taliban who was killed by the government's police. Hamza apparently be began to feel that his family was being persecuted by the Afghani government and the police, and he described these circumstances in his asylum request, and his social worker was actually concerned that this would negatively impact his chance at obtaining a refugee status. In the referral letter, the social worker reported that a few months after his arrival, she and her colleagues had visited the apartment Hamza stayed in and discovered that it was quite dilapidated. So attached to the referrals were actual, actual photographs of the apartment that showed holes in the doors and walls, which seemed as though they had been punched in multiple times. Some walls were broken from floor to ceiling and a radiator looked like he had been directly pulled off from the wall. And there was also like twisted 
plumbing and broken pieces that were skewed haphazardly uh, away from their support. So Audrey continued to summarize the situation. At his own request, Hamza was driven to the district emergency psychiatric service where he saw a psychiatrist who prescribed an antidepressant treatment. According to the social worker, Hamza may not have taken the treatment, but he saw the, the psychiatrist twice. And despite this, he continued to damage the walls as the photographs showed. At the beginning, there were holes, but then the walls ended being completely destroyed, and there were also problems with the neighbors, and complaints against him were filed by the housing manager. So in response, yet again, a hospitalization request was made by a judge. Amza was admitted to the same hospital, seen by the same psychiatrist, who decided Hamza could leave the hospital because he did not think Hamza suffered from a psychiatric pathology. Rather, he thought it was, quote unquote, merely a behavioral disorder. He held this opinion even though Hamza was hospitalized under constraint. The psychiatrist decided to let Hamza go at the end of the day. And again, the social worker realized that Hamza never took the prescribed treatment, the antidepressant and the anxiety medication, and that he had continued to damage the apartment. This time, he had destroyed the plumbing installation, and ultimately, the manager filed a new complaint. Earlier that day, Audrey had called the social worker to get more information. The latter informed her that for the past few months, they had received more complaints, including from the local police, who reported that Hamza had assaulted people in the streets and damaged, dam damaged things outside. As a result, the housing landlord was planning to let go of him. They were going to request for him to be transferred to the Paris area, but the condition was that he received medical follow-up in the CADA where he was being transferred. The social worker complained to Audrey that the local psychiatric hospital had not done anything for Hamza, and that the local mental health care clinic did not want to see him with an interpreter either. She added that Hamza himself reported threatened when he was in the street and that he was extremely anxious about his asylum request. So how do staff members react to referrals like this one? And there again, Audrey provides a strong example. She had no prior formal experience before working at Centre Minkowska, other than a three months internship in a pediatric unit of a major Parisian hospital. Considering her lack of prior work experience, it's unlikely that she would have been given the same responsibilities elsewhere as she now has as a coordinator of those media core meetings. With the help of the medical secretaries that she supervises, Audrey filters incoming referrals and contacts referring professionals for additional information or to direct patients to other services. She's conscientious about her job and regularly stays after hours to finish her paperwork. Given her commitment to the center, strong caregiving ethics, and relatively recent experience with the healthcare system, she reg regularly encounters situations that challenge her moral ideals and lead to indignation in the face of professional disengagement. Audrey is actually defending her master anthropology thesis at the same time I'm speaking. This is interesting. No, I did not. Uh, so I just kept slides for di dialogues I will be reading in a minute. Following deliberations around Hamza's violent behavior, Dr. Benegadi, a psychiatrist and medical head at the clinic, dictated the response we should send to the social workers. So various jokes followed and the tense atmosphere dissipated. See how the situation affects you, Dr. Benegadi commented. The fact that we're not helping someone who's doing badly Media Corps is in a trance. He then asked if anyone wanted to comment on the decision or on how they felt about the negotiation. And Audrey started. Audrey. So again, it seems to me extremely serious, this issue of medical responsibility. Dr. Benegadi in a soft but firm tone. Audrey. You have no grounds to stand up in any way, in any manner, against medical responsibility. You don't know anything. You don't know what happened. So you cannot generalize that way. But it's a hospital. It's not normal. Maybe, but from what Mediacorp can observe from Paris, well, 
I would add that this smell would be even more efficient in Vertancia, Vertancia who's a social worker, could call the person back to tell her, well, we discussed the situation, we wrote you a letter that can help you, do not hesitate to use, to, to use it to question colleagues. And that's it, we did the job. We don't ab abandon colleagues when they ask for help. Marie Jo, who's the co-director at Minkoska at that point said, okay, let's move on to the rest of the referrals. And Dr. Benegadi continued, hold on, because I can see Audrey still hangry. Audrey, it's not anger, it's not. Dr. Benegadi, come on, you can unload. You were moved by this situation. Well, it's not that I've moved, it's always the same problem. I'm the one who opens the mail and it's a recurring problem. And in this case, it's very serious. As far as I'm concerned, if someone I know tomorrow is assaulted by this person, do I agree with the psychiatrist's position? I mean, you can't protect them. I know that in, any, in my position as a simple nurse, I couldn't say he certainly made a mistake, and perhaps he didn't make any. But considering the photographs, I think there is a problem that Hamza is not doing well, I think. And I may be mistaken, perhaps the doctor's right. In fact, I think it's because the patient could not speak French and that he surely said, oh, I don't know, and he preferred getting rid of the situation. But in this case, there are complaints. So Audrey's comments convey her sense of frustration in the face of referring institutions that take advantage of Centro Minkowska's services and of this institution's related disengagement. In usual media call meetings, Dr. Benegadi encourages the expression of affect not to expose the person, but to foster reflexivity. In this session in particular, however, I also had a sense that Dr. Benegadi himself, as a physician, felt ill at ease with the question of medical responsibility. During delib deliberations, he seemed particularly eager to vouch for his colleagues, even making assumptions about how seriously they had taken their responsibility. So as Audrey continued to voice her doubts over the medical evaluations of Hamza's behavior, he chose to question the social workers' responsibility instead. And he said, well, she, the social worker, can call, her, can call too. Let her take the responsibility as well and call them. Tell them there is a risk so they know about it. Audrey, but they do know about it. They file a complaint. Dr. Benegadi, well, if more elements are brought to their attention, if the social worker shares their anxiety of the risks by bringing more information, the shrink will see, how, will see things differently. He's not going to screw it up, he can't. He's responsible for the patient's health. Maybe he was just told, oh, it's a refugee, he's a refugee, he has issues. But we, we can help fill out the information so the colleagues realize that there may be something. They must do the job of informing and assisting by relying on the mail. That's the public health role we play. That's how we are efficient. MediaCorp thus offers a space where affect can be expressed and to some extent to legitimately participate in the logics of professional deliberation itself. In this conversation, Audrey, a nurse, downplays the weight of her own arguments in the face of medical decisions. However, with Dr. Benegadi's encouragement, she nonetheless finds a way to articulate her ethical reasoning and express her sense of discomfort. Dr. Benegadi responds from an institutional perspective, tentatively reasserting the reasons behind Centre Minkowska's decision not to intervene directly. This kind of effective deliberation offers staff members the possibility of considering other perspectives and decentering their own biases as the following shows. Dr. Benegadi to Audrey. You are in the B phase of people who work at Minkowska. Phase A is fascination. Phase B is indignation. And the third phase coming up will be decentering and cultural competence. You have no choice. You cannot, if you didn't care about it, you wouldn't talk about it. Since you care about it and since what cannot what we can discuss here touches upon what is human, and sometimes it's unbearable, it's very good that we can manage the emotional within the technical. We are alive. We don't see this problem from a distance. It moves us. So we must be able to be moved while we keep decentering. It's important, but it's normal. It's a normal process. Vertancia went through this, and she can tell you about it. We almost hospitalized her, almost, ha, ha, ha. 
So beneath the protective functions of humor and metaphors, Audrey and Dr. Benegadi questioned the leg le legitimacy of the action required by Centre Minkowska in this case, and safely expressed their ambivalence about the motives of referring state professionals. The cultural competence approach advocated by the Centre supports the ex expression and consideration of many different perspectives among staff members. He also provides a deliberative framework through which people's emotions, feelings, and ideas in relation to their everyday work can be discussed and managed. This allows staff, mem staff members to learn how to cope with the limits of the health system in which they must necessarily work. Decentering, or that is the ability to adopt a more distant, objective viewpoint, and the management of effective logics of work the capacity to work through people's emotions, feelings, and ideas are thus integrated in cultural competence approach. Decentering in this framework does not entail condoning discriminatory referrals or violent situations so as the one exposed here. Rather, it is an asset that allows professionals to deal with complex situations on a daily basis, a work of posture that defines the very possibility of managing uncertainty and of accepting situation in which a person is in a position of not knowing. So at the end of this collaborative, co collaborative process, there is no right or wrong answer. Rather, there is an answer whose rationale has been more intelligible. Importantly, this process enables the expression and deliberation upon ambiguous positions, which are often less tolerated in other medical spaces such as hospitals and clinics. And as Dr. Benegadi admitted that same day, at times we are in very ambiguous borderline positions. In a sense, Mediaco helps staff members at Minkoska manage the institutional anxieties that arise from the borderland context in which they operate. Ultimately, I suggest that staff members prioritize the logics of caregiving by helping refereeing agents unpack individual situations. So does this choice support a, a stigmatizing order? I would nuance and argue that their efforts to resist the cultural or linguistic categories used by state agents to frame migrant suffering and to critically reflect on an appropriate clinical responses to potentially stigmatizing referrals do challenge the ways in which referrals to specialized mental health care centers act as a regulative force in the lives of migrants. Thank you. And finally, we have Saiba. You want to move here? To say this, uh, I put Saiba's talk at the end intentionally because I, I was very glad that this is probably going to be the very first project that offers anthropological critique of cancel culture. And you probably have uh, been following Johnny Depp's case, so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> we are in sync with the trending news, so. <laughs> but it's uh, it's based on um, personal experience, and I just want to thank Saiba in particular, specific, especially for offering her contribution in this forum. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience, um, for listening to all of us this afternoon. Um, oops. Okay. Last September, I was canceled. My cancellation came not from those with whom I had strong political disagreements. Rather, I was canceled by fellow anthropologists, many of whom share the same ethical and political commitments as me and also occupy a structural position as a racialized minority in an overwhelmingly white discipline. This paper is a first effort to understand the causes and conditions and the disciplinary anxieties that allowed those closest to me to mete out the worst cruelty. I use the word cruelty here fo following the black feminist and activist Loretta Ross, who notes that when you become the object of a call out, you become a, quote, legitimate target for anger. They deny your perception of reality. They pretend like you don't exist. 
and the overstatement of harm is used to justify cruelty, end quote. In this paper, I show how canceling me made anxieties about long-standing entanglements in, uh, between anthropology, colonialism, whiteness, and militarism concrete. In using the term anxiety, I'm not trying to pathologize those who express concerns about my research. Anxiety is a quintessential and necessary human experience. It can be both protective and dangerous. In the longer version of this paper, I elaborate four destructive anxieties that clustered around to produce my cancellation. It's what Nutsa um, earlier was talking about as a kind of overdetermined um, semantic field. Uh, but because of time today, I will just foreground one of those clusters, which was an effort to kind of purify anthropology and purify uh, the project of decolonizing anthropology by expelling me uh, from its ranks. I want to suggest that destructive anxiety is defined by an inability to adequately confront and grapple with contradiction. Destructive anxiety led decolonial scholars to espouse logics and behaviors that ultimately close down rather than open up space for intellectual discourse. And in the conclusion, I want to offer an alternative uh, to that kind of politics of purity, you know, that is a part of cancel culture, which I am calling a politics of and from the muck. It all began on September 14th, 2021, a blazing hot summer morning in Southern California. I had just gotten off the phone with a friend in Kashmir when a bunch of notifications popped up on my Twitter app. A new thread consisting of 22 tweets had tagged me. The thread originated from a newly created anonymous account called Settler Scholarship. As soon as I clicked on it, my heart sank. The thread was about me. It named me as a researcher with questionable ethics who had worked in Kashmir, one of the world's most militarized places, which has been caught between a territorial dispute between India, Pakistan, and China for the past 70 years. Um, and most people in the Indian-occupied uh, side of Kashmir, where I did my research, want self-determination or independence. The thread revealed that my father had worked for the Indian External Intelligence Services, called the Research and Analysis Wing, or RAW, an organization shrouded in mystery, terror, and fear, much like other intelligence agencies the world over. The thread noted that I had not mentioned my father's employment history in my book, The Occupied Clinic, which had been published a year earlier. The thread asked questions about what my silence meant, the ethical questions it raised for how I had presented myself to those I had interviewed. It asked what else I had hidden, what access or benefits I had potentially accrued from my father's position, or alternatively, how I may have compromised those I interviewed. The thread contained a heady mix of fact and distortion, of legitimate questions about ethnographic research methods in conflict zones, combined with deliberate misreadings of my work and its arguments. As I scanned it, physical sensations of panic took hold of my body. My stomach flipped, clenched, and then dropped as if I was on a roller coaster. What worried me most was that from the beginning of the thread to the end, the questions seamlessly morphed into allegations, and from allegations into truths. I had a frightening realization. If I didn't know me, I thought, I would believe it all. More than 50 handles were tagged, prominent Kashmiri intellectuals and journalists, Duke University Press, my, the US publisher of my book, my Indian publisher, Yoda Press, other academics of South Asia, as well as scholarly and news outlets. The thread was rigged to blow. A fact about my father's life that I had shared carefully for most of mine, for my own safety, for my father's safety, and for my family's safety, had been outed in front of the world. Though my book critiqued India's occupation of Kashmir, a position that was completely opposed, antithetical, uh, to the Indian military and security complex, 
and a political position that was actually punishable by Indian law as sedition, and one that risked me destroying my relationship with my family. The broadcasting of my father's former work cast my professional standing, my ethics, and my politics into question. In the social media storm, my agency and scholarship disappeared from view. I was publicly called a colonial and colonizer researcher, and in one instance, a colleague even compared me to a Nazi scholar, and um, any Kashmiri scholars who defended me or stood up for me were, were called collaborators. Uh, within a day, the thread had accumulated hundreds of tweets, retweets, likes, and shares, and had spawned countless new threads and posts on Twitter. My Indian publisher stopped printing the Indian edition of my book. In the following days, the thread led to public statements and condemnations of my work by hundreds of leftist anthropologists and academics. Almost 200 scholars wrote to my US publisher, Duke University Press, and indirectly suggested that my book should be banned. A handful of Kashmiri expatriate scholars also publicly disavowed me. Although we had collaborated on writing projects, we had never shared the intimacy of our family histories. Though many Kashmiri intellectuals supported me behind the scenes, a public disavowal by a few scholars was enough to sink my legitimacy. I was soiled goods. Meanwhile, on right-wing Twitter, my cancellation was gleefully celebrated. I was called a jihadi, who had been canceled by fellow jihadis, and those tweets accumulated thousands of, of likes. Over the next few days, with the help of a few friends, I worked feverishly to publish a 4,000-word essay responding to the ethical and methodological questions raised by the thread. My response was published in The Wire, an independent Indian news outlet, alongside a letter signed by 53 scholars of South Asia who also condemned me. In my response, I tried to address the critiques, apologize to those who had felt hurt about my decision not to discuss my father's former profession in my book, while also opening space for further conversation about complicity and ethics in conflict zones. I ended the statement on a note of continued learning and listening. Despite my response, the attacks continued. I became a symptom of the rot inside colonial, capitalist, and casteist academic institutions. My losses piled up like carcasses in a slaughterhouse. A book prize that I had won was revoked. A conference panel that discussed my book was canceled. I was disinvited from, from reading groups. My work was removed from an online syllabus of Kashmir studies. My contributions were dropped from two journal special issues. I was removed from collaborative projects, including one that I had co-founded with my closest friends from graduate school. I was kicked out of my writing group. At my university, I was publicly disaffiliated from multiple departments and programs, all without a single conversation. Public statements issued against me were sent out to hundreds of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty across the University of California. I was described as a security threat, as someone who had committed gross and egregious harms against my research subjects, that this was something that was repeated on social media without any evidence um, at all, as someone with whom others, around whom others no longer felt safe. I was thrown out of an activist organization that was working to demilitarize campus police. I was banned from a mutual aid organization in San Diego that I had volunteered with during the pandemic. Friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and even strangers broke up with me. And I was almost sure I would also be asked to leave this workshop as well. And so I just want to thank um, the organizers for giving me the space to tell my story. I was not at all prepared for this avalanche of exclusion. I could not grasp how leftist, activist, anti-racist, and decolonial anthropologists, many of whom I had shared meals with, classrooms with, conference panels with, protests with, 
had drinks with, whose work I had loved and read and taught, had blacklisted me without even picking up the phone. Ironically, while US-based academics condemn me, none of my Kashmiri interlocutors, people who I'd actually worked with in the field, canceled me. Although we had some complex conversations, they offered me an even deeper sense of solidarity, love, and support than they had for the past 14 years. And without them, I definitely would not be here today. Meanwhile, anthropologists who had never visited Kashmir or South Asia openly told me that I should never have gone to Kashmir and done this work. Under the weight of others' accusations, my sense of self began to crumble. For months, I sat with a feeling of nausea, of dismemberment. In his essay, Inhibition, Symptoms, and Anxiety, Freud writes that anxiety is a legitimate response to the feeling of helplessness one experiences in a traumatic situation. However, Freud notes that anxiety can also take another less beneficial form. Repeated exposure to dangerous and traumatic situations can lead to signals misfiring, to anxiety morphing from its protective to its destructive function. The German-Jewish political theorist Franz Neumann expanded Freud's theory to think about how objective anxiety can become destructive when collectivized. As Neumann showed, authoritarian leaders can create destructive anxiety through different strategies, including one he calls false concreteness. That is, blaming a particular individual or community as being the root of their anxiety. Like Freud, Newman recognized anxiety's morally ambiguous nature. The two forms of anxiety, the protective and the destructive, can and do commingle. My cancellation exemplified this commingling. It was the product of both protective and destructive anxiety. And here I, sort of, I understand destructive anxiety as erupting at the moment where we lose our capacity to grapple with ambiguity, alternative possibilities, and complexity. We find ourselves in a morally simplistic, polarized, Manichaean black and white world. Destructive anxiety stunts growth. It seeks to invisibilize rather than engage with the contradictions that are inherent to any liberatory project, including efforts to decolonize anthropology. Rather, through processes of magical thinking, destructive anxiety seeks an ethical shortcut. Decolonial anthropologists were among the most vociferous in their opposition to me. Because of my family history, I was deemed ineligible to call myself a decolonial scholar, while many white anthropologists were you know, granted impunity from these questions altogether. In me, decolonial anthropologists saw the material embodiments of the colonial history of anthropology, particularly anthropology's long collusion with war and militarization, from CIA-funded research during the Cold War to more, research in, uh, more recent entanglements between anthropologists and US empire in the post-9-11 wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. Efforts to decolonize anthropology are haunted by an anxiety of helplessness. Despite a century of critique of anthropology's colonialism, its whiteness, its racism, despite decades of powerful work from black, indigenous, and people of color scholars, colonialism is not an abstract presence in US universities, but remains persistent, material, and concrete. In a recent lecture on decoloniality and ethnographic fieldwork, the Maori de decolonial scholar Linda Tuiwai Smith said, I can't believe we are still talking about this. There was sadness in her voice. We are still talking about this. I can understand some of the cruelty that was meted out to me as a knee jerk response to this danger, a collective sigh of never again. Rather than use the Twitter storm to productively discuss re research ethics, and think through the contradictions of a decolonial project, decolonial anthropologists became destructively anxious. I became the embodiment of duplicity and danger. 
On Twitter, a well-known anthropologist described my case as evidence for the need for a moratorium on all decolonial anthropology. Until when, I wondered. Until someone establishes a price of admission for who gets to do decolonial work? By expelling me as the embodiment of colonial violence, decolonial anthropologists dealt with their destructive anxiety through two magical gestures. First, they enacted a politics of purity or purification. By deeming me impure, they acted as if they had purged the university of any trace of colonialism or militarism. I became the very embodiment of colonial, white, upper caste, militaristic logics and tendencies in the discipline, while they were pure, representing marginalized, oppressed, subaltern, decolonial perspectives. Second, and relatedly, by canceling me, they magically resolved or bracketed their own anxieties about their own complicities. As one Kashmiri friend and anthropologist pointed out to me, no one canceling me said anything about the ethical negotiations and compromises in their own research. From his perspective, all the voices condemning me were privileged because of their location in US and UK academia. None were actually living under the knife of occupation. So where do we go from here? Um, how do we climb out of the spiral of danger, helplessness, and anxiety? And how might we refuse the toxic perfectionism, the politics of purity that characterizes US academia? Though I'm still working through this material, what I do know is that the politics of purity are antithetical to the decolonial politics I have learned from working in Kashmir. And instead, by way of conclusion, I want to offer two alternatives to, to this kind of purity politics, that of compromised subjects and also the uh, decolonial politics of and from the muck. As one of my closest interlocutors in Kashmir once told me, I live and work in the muck every day. For him, being in the muck referred to living with the ethical and political compromises that occupation demands. Being compromised is a condition of survival. Nonetheless, he firmly believed that ethical and political self-fashioning was possible and necessary apart from situations you could, cannot control, like who your parents are. Though he himself was politically committed to Kashmiri independence, a close family member of his was a police officer who upheld Indian rule. Yet embracing the personal and historical ambiguities and contradictions that we all have does not mean that anything goes, right? That doesn't mean that like, we can all just be as contradictory and as ambiguous as we want. That's what he said. Rather, he said, the standards by which you conduct yourself have to be even higher. This was true for people who are living under occupation, and even more so for those researching it. Among the many painful lessons that my cancellation taught me is how US anthropology and its overwhelming cultural whiteness are not conducive to the kinds of personal, professional, and political entanglements that my friend described. How can a process of decolonizing ourselves not be long, imperfect, and messy? In deciding, in, in my decision to do my PhD research in Kashmir, a place where my father had served for a short posting when I was 10 years old, I rebelled against my family. Over the years, Kashmir friends and colleagues who learned to trust me slowly, you know, and over a long period of time, generously shaped my work and, those, and my connections to them obligated me to produce scholarship that was politically useful to the struggle. Yet figuring out how to do this was not easy or quick. Meanwhile, with the rise of the right-wing Hindu nationalist government in India, Kashmiri intellectuals, journalists, and human rights activists were arrested, detained, and faced uncertain long exiles. This discrepancy between my relative safety and theirs galvanized me to take more risks because I could. Writing my book, Occupied Clinic was my political coming out. In choosing this title, I wanted to lay bare the politics of Indian state occupation 
so there was no ambiguity about where I stood. Doing so made clear the personal and political stakes, uh, risks I was willing to take for this new social world that had become so meaningful to me. Occupied was how people in Kashmir who desired independence, those with and for whom I was writing, defined their reality. Yet, when, I, when my book came out, um, you know, as one of my father's friends told me, he said, I consider myself a liberal. But even for me, your book goes too far. It's hard to swallow. This person's message to me was clear. In naming Kashmir an occupation, I was alienating both left and right-leaning Indians. And both hung me out to dry. Though I did not talk explicitly about my father's work in my book, my omission was not due to a lack of attention or care. I wrote the book not from a place of innocence, but from someone complicit in the violence of colonization and in the structures of in inequity that produce research and knowledge. I wrote the book I could without entirely dissolving my relationship with my father. And my discipline, my leftist progressive colleagues, failed to grant me this complexity. Um, I want to sort of end this talk with just, I wanted to end this talk with a story of my own learning, my own kind of journey through this, to show what it looks like to still be committed to producing decolonial scholarship, but as a kind of compromise subject, you know, as I am. And to also show that my, per my efforts were not perfect, you know, how, how can they be, right? That's not really the goal. Um, the fears, anxieties, and dangers that were marshaled to cancel me were all real. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, all of the questions that were raised were all possible, right? They could have all been true. And I think they reveal um, the need for kind of urgent res redressal of those things in the discipline. However, uh, what allows me to sleep in, at night <laughs> is that I allowed my work to transform me. The Twitter storm left no space for relationality, for mutuality or trust to grow between two differently positioned human beings, both of whom were wading in the muck. It left no room for my research subjects, my friends and interlocutors in Kashmir to speak. They were only spoken for. Yet cultivating those relationships of trust across terrains of difference, across silences, compromises, negotiations, these are the necessary anti-anxiety machines that we need to orient knowledge towards a more liberatory goal and make ourselves a little less anxious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saif. This is emotional for all of us, I think. So we'll end the session on this note. I want to thank everyone uh, for coming and for staying for more than two hours. And, um, but I want to thank our staff, who's not here right now, but who helped us arrange the workshop and the meetings. And, but most of all, I want to thank you all publicly, which I've done a bazillion times throughout these days, and I'll do more. But I'm very happy, except for Katie, all of you are here. It's your first trip to Georgia, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That was great, and your attention. <laughs>